Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. Here's the wolf predator. Uh, and here's the red aliens. Because this is uh, this is how it is now. It's, it's what happens to old effects. Thank you guys for showing up in long pants. Oh. Mm -hmm. It looks professional. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Woodruff Jr. from Amalgamated Dynamics Incorporated. And I'm the other half of Amalgamated Dynamics Inc., Alec Gillis. Open you guys up. Yeah. Am I sitting too far apart from Tom? Should we be? Um, I think it's it's pretty good. Yeah. But you're the good. guy that has absolutely yeah. no experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. One of the sort of the myths about Jurassic Park is that it was primarily digital. Um, when Stan Winston was alive, he sat with a stopwatch and timed the film. And I believe it was 11 minutes of dinosaurs, and the breakdown was something about f like four minutes of CGI, and the rest was practical. The movie business is a sales business, so you're going to promote the newest sexiest technology and that was the, the digital technology and it was amazing it was... we're gonna make a fortune with this place we were both very disheartened with what happened on the prequel to the thing because that is an animatronic creature effects artist dream to, to be tapped to come back in because we showed up on set with i have to say pretty pretty cool stuff. The idea was, we'll do this much of it in CGI, we'll add tentacles or legs, and it just became, CGI became the thing, the monster that overtook all of our practical stuff. sand beetle is superior in many ways. It has no ego, has no fear. We think that what you get from a real creature is the fact that it exists in the light with the other actors. tactile thing that's an actual real object and also give a benchmark for the digital artist to match to the digital queen in AVP looks great in part because we had a real queen there oh, more drool more and more drool more and more drool the reason Weta does such great digital character work is that they also have their foot in practical effects, so they don't necessarily see a competition between the two. They'll actually build heads that they then scan and they, they examine and all that. So they, they really are looking at the practical effect as a necessary asset towards creating mm. uh, the digital effect. And their eyes are so fantastic. Weta's eyes are so fantastic. Mm. Mm. So are Peter Jackson. The Fellowship of the Ring has relatively few digital effect shots. Back when we had enough work and we had enough paying jobs coming in, we were able to push a certain amount of money into research and developing things. At the end of a film, we might say, you know what was cool about this movie? This material and this technique, and let's just spend a couple of weeks and play around and see where we can go, try something different. And since the mid-90s, which, which is really around the time when CGI really kind of became the tool of choice for everybody straight across the board, we didn't have the, the necessary budget to put into finding the next big thing. There's also a misconception that I see pop up. People assume we have more control than we actually do. They don't really understand the, the scrutiny that the work is under. And in the case of a, a Marvel, any comic book hero, you have not only the, direct, the director weighing in, but you have the studio. And then you also have the company like, like a Marvel who, who owns it. Like you just said you liked the uh, design of the Pred Alien. I mean, it is good design, it's a solid design, right? The story of that design is that we went through many, many iterations. We finally settled on one that pleased not only you know the several um, executive producers at Fox, but the two co-directors. And then we did a maquette of it, and we sent it over to Fox for them to look at and just peruse. And a 14-year-old kid happened to be there visiting the studio. One of the producers said, hey kid, you're the demographic, come in here. Take a look at this. And based on that kid's reaction, we had to make last minute changes to the design. They don't come from the same world that we come from. They didn't, they didn't spend their lives growing up loving monsters and living monsters and breathing monsters. And that's where things start to 
somewhat go awry. And ruining the creatures. I know that's what some of you are thinking. <laughs> ruining the alien, did we? There are people out there who have named what we did on uh, Alien Resurrection the, quote, beast look. And they go on to say that we ruined the creature, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the things that people don't uh, stop to think about is that there's a need to service every script, to service plot points in every script. And one of the plot points in that script was that all of these aliens were created by uh, Ripley's DNA. So the director specifically requested that our alien not be as biomechanical, that it be softened so that there's some human DNA aspect to it. We foolishly uh, made the director happy instead of those 14 guys out there on the interwebs who are still complaining about Alien Resurrection. The downside of the animatronic stuff is that generally you have to do more pre-planning. You can't sort of wing it on set as easily. You got cables coming out or you got six people that have to be moved and, and so on. And of course, Paul Verhoeven is a very much of a stickler and you know, he wants everything to be exactly perfect. So you shoot, if you have to shoot 50 times, I don't give a shit. A hundred times, I don't care. And that, in some instances, is perceived as too big a limitation to be worth it. It was really telling on the prequel to The Thing. We came up with this one uh, a character who's going to split open and, and become another version of The Thing. And, and, and it starts off with him sitting in a helicopter and he's getting sick and blood, you know, all the, all the things leading up, the little steps leading up to him. And then he suddenly stands up and he, and he erupts. And we had this idea of wanting to do it all in camera, or most of it in camera, and augment it by adding more tentacles. On. So I'm putting it on and it's all in front of me. And if I turn sideways, you would see my head and then you see the head sticking out here. But in the front, it's like a stage illusion. Now we tested it on video and it looked great. We got great, great response back. The, the, the VFX people came over and wanted to check it out in our shop. And they stood in front and said, yeah, it looks great. And they kept doing this. They kept going to the side going, ah, but here, you know, it doesn't work. And here it doesn't work, and yeah, they the willingness to commit to a way of shooting something to make it as effective as possible has been challenged and, and, and undermined. We can't ever take the position that one art is universally better than the other. We're in a position right now where our art is being tamped down and suppressed by the studio thinking, the corporate logic, right? So. We would never want to just flip that paradigm and say, and now practical effects are now suppressing all digital. That would be silly. As filmmakers, who would want that? I mean, we don't. So we, we do promote the blend of the, of the two techniques because CGI has, is every bit as artistic as practical effects.